Thank you, Celebration Choir. Susan Austin, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Praise Team, for leading us in worship with those wonderful songs. This morning, imagine if you were at the park back in the summer, hot summer day, running hard, playing hard, 95 degrees outside, getting hotter by the minute, but you didn't bring anything to drink. And you're perspiring, you're dying of thirst. And some body that you don't know walks up and says, you look rough. Would you like something to drink out of my thermos? What would you do? Imagine if you had to move, town, move from town. Imagine if you got a new job. And uh, you moved to a new community in a different city. And after work, you were at home watching TV, doing whatever. The doorbell rings. And a, uh, a well-dressed person walks up to your door you've never seen before and says, I want you to come to my church, and they give you an invitation. What do you do? Imagine if you were on the fifth floor of a building that caught on fire, and the smoke is suffocating you, the heat's just terrible, it's driving you crazy, and, and you're thinking, what am I going to do? The fire department hasn't shown up, and there's some guys yelling at you from the window, and you get to the window, and you can feel your hair singeing. I mean, the ceiling's about to, 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 to come down, and they, they have a blanket. I don't know where they would come up with a blanket, but they have a blanket. Four or five of them pulling. And they say, jump, we'll catch you. What do you do? Well, the way you would answer those three questions says a lot about you. I don't think any of us like any of those options. I don't. But the way you answer those questions say a lot about your level of faith. Your level of faith in the, the, your, the circumstances and your level of faith in the people you're dealing with. And this morning and, and next Sunday morning, we're going to discuss the topic of faith. Today we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. And it's going to be a little while before we get there, but you can turn there if you'd like. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about faith. And today we're going to talk about two kinds of faith. What is faith? Well, there's probably a million different definitions for what faith is. Here's a working definition of faith. Putting your trust in something. Faith. In, in our situation here, obviously, putting your faith, putting your trust in God. See, God is worthy of our trust. He's trustworthy. He will do everything he promised to do. God keeps his promises, and he's made many. And the question I'd like for, for us to think about this morning is, are we trusting Christ with the critical areas of our lives? Are you specifically trusting Christ in the critical areas of your life, your family, your finances? your kids, your health, your future, your every, everything. Do you trust Christ with your fears, with your insecurities, every single area of your life? You see, faith is the critical, foundational element in the process of spiritual birth, spiritual renewal. It's everything. Confusion in this area is why so many people leave the church. Why do we only keep 10, 15 percent, maybe 20 at the most percent, of our, our students that graduate in our churches. And that's a national average for Southern Baptist churches. I believe many of them get disenchanted with the faith. Ultimately, people want to believe in something. Everybody wants to believe in something. And I believe people do believe in something. Everybody believes in something. Whether it's yourself, your abilities, your talents, maybe it's a person, that person you look up to, they are so incredible and you have faith in that person. Or, or a religion, maybe God, hopefully God, is who we ultimately have our faith in. But people are looking for something where they can, where they can place their trust. Yet we get disenchanted sometimes, don't we? We get, we get let down. I think we've all, I believe we all have faith in something and we've all probably been let down a time or two. And uh, my good friend Dave Simmons could tell you all about it. Five years ago, uh, Dave and I found ourselves in the position of doing uh, what's called a trust fall. Remember that? I'm a big boy. Those little kids caught me. When Dave got up, didn't work out so nice. Bam! On the ground. I don't know if he's ever done a trust fall since. I very seriously doubt he would. I wonder if any of you have ever spent any time in a dunking booth. I have. See, when you get in a dunking booth, you trust that when you sit in the chair of the dunking booth, which is as awkward and, and terrible as possible, slightly slanting down anyway, and you're just holding on for dear life, just sitting there, 
that the, that the people participating are going to throw some sort of ball or something at a target. What you don't expect, what you don't count on, is folks just walking up and going, punch, and they let you down. I think there's probably people here this morning that feel like your life is a little bit like a, a, a dunking booth, and someone's just going, punch. So we lose our faith. Our faith gets, gets damaged. Our faith gets weakened. But faith is central to life. Think about this. You go to a doctor whose name you can't pronounce, whose degree you've never verified, and he looks at you, looks in your ear, looks in your mouth. He writes you a prescription that you can't read. You take it to a pharmacist who you don't know, who fills it up with chemicals that you have no clue about and they have direction on that you have no idea who wrote them. And then you pop those pills. And what? You expect to get better, don't you? In fact, you'd feel cheated if you didn't get better. I mean, in a day. We have faith in modern medicine. Why is it so hard for us to have faith in God? Hebrews 11 talks about faith. Let's look at it. Hebrews 11, we'll read the first six verses. This is the hall of faith. This is the faith chapter. It, this recognizes the faith of great men like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and right on down the line. But the first few verses that we're going to look at today tell us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 2 says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand what the world, that the worlds were framed, by the word of God. So the, th the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Through faith, he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was translated so that he did not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God or to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 tells us a lot about faith. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, we're going to look at it next week in detail. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight or he will make your paths smooth. See, God is trustworthy. And we read the, the nuts and bolts of faith in the New Testament. We can look at Old Testament examples. In fact, go back to Psalm 55. And let's look at the example of David. King David had faith. And all of the examples in, in, in Hebrews 11 were people looking forward to the cross, forward to the promise with faith. And I think in verse 39 it says they didn't even get to experience it. Like us, we know the rest of the story. They didn't. It was an incomplete story at that time. But even, even with that incomplete story, King David had faith. Psalm 55, 22, he says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. See, we should be casting our burdens. I guarantee there are unbearable burdens represented in every pew. People that are hurting, people that are discouraged, people that are disenchanted. Your faith has been tested. Don't let your faith be destroyed by circumstances. Cast your burdens on the Lord. Verse 23, but you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Don't you love David? Very politically correct. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live the half of their days, but I will trust in you. Look at verse 56. Be merciful to, to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. Ever feel that way? My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Verse 3, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God will I praise in his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. That's real faith. That's powerful faith. Faith. That's life-changing faith. That's the faith that people will hold on to and never let go. Today let's talk about the two kinds of faith. First of all, circumstantial faith. Faith that is built or based on feelings and events. Circumstantial faith, fake faith, foolish faith, you might call it. Jesus said the wise man built his house on the rock, and the foolish man built his house on the sand. Circumstantial faith is faith that is built on shifting sand, on life circumstances. 
It's faith, faith that is built on feelings and events. Ultimately, it's faith that's basically built on yourself and your perception of God versus who God really is. Augustine said, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. That's where we are right now. That's where our, our I think many, many Christians are right now. We all know people who used to believe in God, don't we? We all know people who used to go to church. They used to be faithful. They used to do the Christian thing. They may say, well, I've lost my faith. Their faith was tempted. It was tried. It was tested. And they gave, gave up on it. When God made sense, great. But God didn't make sense in, a, in some temporary situation. And they turned their back on it. They said, this doesn't work for me. I don't need this. Their faith was shattered by some circumstance in life. There are two main factors that shatter people's faith. One is unexplainable tragedies. The second one would be poor choices. Unexplainable tragedies come into a person's life. You didn't expect them. You didn't know that they were coming. They hit you or they hit your family or they hit a church or they hit a nation. And, man, we're just in shock. How could God allow this to happen? Something that that destroys people's faith more than anything else or shatters their faith is when God allows something bad to happen to a good person. Now, that whole statement is fundamentally flawed in a number of ways. But people don't see it that way. People see themselves as generally good. How could God let something happen to me, such a good person? How could God let something happen to this wonderful nation we live in? And the ultimate example is September 11, 2001. How did God allow that to happen? Why would God allow that to happen? How did God let Hurricane Katrina happen? Not only did he let it happen, it's, it's nature we're talking about in this situation. How did that happen? Why would God let that happen? Why would God let another hurricane, Wilma, will be beating up on Florida and all these other places for the next 24 hours or 36 hours or whatever? Why? Unless we feel too proud of ourselves because that, we're so above that, that's really not the case, is it? We're all susceptible to having our faith shattered by unexplainable tragedies, whether it's, it's a divorce that you never thought would ever, that could never happen to me. That would never happen to me and yet you find yourself in that situation. Your child gets sick. You lose your job. Some terrible circumstance comes in your life, and your faith is challenged. Unexplainable tragedies can shatter faith, and so can poor choices. Poor choices would be where someone veers off ethically or morally, and then when they they get involved in that situation, the tidal wave of guilt just is, is overwhelming. They can't handle it. And by the way, guilt, I mean, think about it. Guilt is the enemy in America. Guilt, whatever, if you're fit, get rid of the guilt. Take the drugs, drink the alcohol, do whatever you need to do. Deny it, do anything, but don't feel guilty. Never really dealing with the real issue. And when a person has that kind of guilt all over them, they have a choice to make. They can either repent and change their life, or they can change their belief system. They can change the way they think and believe, to allow for their lifestyle. We see it all the time. Homosexuality in our nation. We, we just totally turned around and said, well, that's acceptable. Didn't used to be acceptable. Now it's acceptable. In the church, sex before marriage, rampant. People living together, call themselves Christians, go to church. How's that possible? Because they've changed it. They don't think of it that way anymore. It's okay, I love them. What's the big deal? Why can't I do that? And church members, Christians fall into this trap. Flirting while married. Cheating on your taxes. Stealing God's tithe, stealing your company time, gossiping, whatever it is, we rationalize. We turn around and say, well, that's not so bad. You know, these are big sins, these are little sins, and that's just not that big of a deal, right? What we have to do is acknowledge, yes, it is. And, and you can trade your faith in for a more convenient lifestyle for a time. But if that's the case, you're proving that you have circumstantial faith. Faith, the roots are just not very deep. And when the winds of life blow and when the storms move in, your faith gets knocked down like a twig. Circumstantial faith will never carry you through the hard times. Many, if not most, Christians possess circumstantial faith. I'm not questioning whether or not they belong to Christ. They're probably saved, but that's about it. And their faith hasn't matured. If there's any scenario that you can think of that will result in you trading in your faith, trading in your values, your convictions, you have circumstantial faith. Faith based on feelings and events and what what makes sense now, what makes sense today, temporary faith. Hebrews 11 
gives us some of the nuts and bolts of what it means to have so much more than that. Because circumstantial faith won't last. This kind of faith will. Eternal faith. Eternal faith. Eternal faith is authentic faith. Real, genuine faith based on the promises of God's word. Nothing more, nothing less. Not based on your circumstances. See, circumstantial faith is, is very, has very shallow roots. Eternal faith has eternal roots. You can never be shaken. Well, maybe you get shaken, but you won't be devastated. Circumstantial faith is based in the short term. Eternal faith, by, very, by its own definition, it's long term. It'll last you forever. It's based on the unchanging, inerrant word of God. On a God who is immutable, he'll never change. Faith built on the rock versus circumstantial faith that's built on the sand. Built on a person. Built on temporary circumstances. Uh, Pastor Andy Stanley, uh, writing on the topic of authentic faith, eternal faith, said this, Just as a child cannot correctly judge his parents' character based upon one painful trip to the doctor, so we dare not draw conclusions about our Heavenly Father based on the immediate circumstances of life. Isn't that true? Do you remember taking your kids to the doctor for their shots? They hated your guts. Why on earth are your lying to heaven to me? But we were doing it for their own good, weren't we? Or so we think, if all the, all the shots and all that really are good and, and, and we're right on that. <laughs> Authentic faith says, I trust you, Lord, even when life hurts. And we all know that it will. It will. But we keep on trusting. We keep on believing. Our faith is in God's promises, not circumstances. Just like Joseph in the Bible. His brother sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife got him thrown in jail, falsely accused. But he never, ever gave up. He never exchanged his faith for the circumstances he was going through. He never forsook his faith. He never forsook his God. And Joseph is honored in verse 22 of Hebrews 11. And so are so many other people. Not perfect people, but people of faith. Let's look back at chapter 11. Let's go through these first six verses again. Verse 1 says, Now faith is. The structure of this verse is telling us that faith is a present and continuing reality. It is not simply a virtue sometimes practiced in antiquity somewhere. It is right now. It's a living thing. It's a way of life. And by the way, yesterday's faith is useless for today's problems, isn't it? That was yesterday. Today's the day. Faith is the substance or the realization of things hoped for. The NIV says it's being sure of what we do not see. These are, there are realities for which we have no material evidence, but they are no less real because of it. Think about your love for your kids. Think about your love for your dog. Why would we ever love an animal? We do, some of you. Cat, whatever, hamster. You love that thing. Now, then you love your family, hopefully on a whole other different level, but you can't, um, like, you can't grab that. You can't handle that. There's no physical reality there, but it's no, it's no less real because of it, is it? It's real. Faith enables us to know that these realities exist, even if we can't see it with our physical eyes. They're real. It's the realization of things hoped for. In 1996, I fell in love with Elizabeth Trachian. She's sitting in the balcony today. She's now Elizabeth Fjordelis. She was the realization of something hoped for. I prayed for years. Oh, God, give me a wife. And as I got further into college, I prayed even more. Oh, God, please give me a wife. And, and lo and behold, he did. I knew he would. I never had a doubt that he would. I had complete confidence that he would. Not because I'm such a great guy, believe me, but because he's such a great guy. That's faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, faith extends beyond what we learn from our senses. By faith we test things that are not seen. It's your faith that when you hear something that doesn't quite jive, I heard a song in the, in the, um, the, 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 um, the restaurant yesterday. Kept saying, we're innocent, we're all innocent, we're innocent, and it must be one of the new pop songs that are out. What a lie. We're innocent? We're not innocent. We stand guilty before God, condemned. And it's, it's your faith that when you hear something that doesn't jive with where your faith lies, you pick it up. The Holy Spirit points it out. 
In verse 2, we see that faith in Christ, both before and after the cross, has always been what saves people. Look at verse 2. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. What does that mean? Well, the elders, again, in verse, look at verse 39. All these having obtained a good testimony through faith, but did not receive the promise. They didn't actually get to see the fruition of their faith when Christ came. But their faith was in the coming Messiah, and, and their faith was, was solid. Their faith was rewarded and recognized in this chapter, men and women of God. In verse 3, we see that the visible world, what we see around us, was not made from anything visible. Now, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Well, that's kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, no, it was created by God's command, at his very command, by his breath, by his words, it was created. And if God created it, he must be pretty powerful. He must be the boss. You see, if it all is just an accident, and by the way, it takes faith to believe that too, that it was just some sort of just hodgepodge, natural, boom, there it happened. It takes faith to believe that. And if that's the case, we don't really need God or authority or rules. We can just do whatever we want. We can kill each other, murder our babies, drink ourselves in the ground. But if it's true, there is a God. And if there is a God who created this planet, and verse 4 is telling us, it takes faith to believe that. Verse 3, excuse me. It takes faith to believe it one way or the other. And when we believe that, it changes the way we live. And we have faith in, in who God is based on what he did. And that's just the, the way it is. We, we have faith in Mark McGuire, McGuire can hit home runs because of who he is and what he did. If you wanted to go have some sort of golf tournament and invited me to it, I wouldn't come. I hate golf. But let's say you paid me and I came. And I could choose my own partner. And whoever wins gets a million dollars. I don't know. You know who I'd pick? I'd pick Tiger Woods. Because I could pick whoever I want in this little mystery situation, right? And we'd win. Even though I'm the world's worst golfer. Why? Because my faith, my confidence was in someone who, who knows what he's doing. Who is the master. That's our faith in Christ. Our faith in God who created this planet. Everything we see. In verse 4, look at verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. We talked about this last week, didn't we? Through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it being dead, he still speaks. Abel's blood offering was based on faith. He did what God asked him to do. He humbled himself. Cain was prideful. Cain did what he wanted to do. I'm going to get to God the way I want to get to God. And that's our world today. I'll do what I want to do. I'll, I'll establish the rules for myself because we live in an egocentric, whacked out world where people think they can do that. And it's not true. Like Cain, they insist on getting to God their own way. They think they know what pleases God better than God knows. Abel was humble. Abel humbled himself and he said, no, I'm going to do it the way God does it, or asked me to do it. And in this chapter, we see that God's way is the way of faith, not works, not, not uh, behavior, not putting on a show, not putting off some perception of, of, of religiosity. In verse 5, we see that Enoch's faith was pleasing to God, so much so that God just took him. Look at verse number 5. By faith, Enoch was translated so that he did not see death. He was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Wouldn't you like that to be said of you? Wouldn't you like that to be said of your children? What pleases God? Faith pleases God. Our faith is what pleases God. Now let's review verse 3, 4, and 5. In verse 3, we see the basis for our faith, creation. And it is a faith decision. We don't have empirical, nobody was there, but we believe God created the heavens and the earth. That's the basis for our faith. He's powerful, he's strong. In verse 4, we see the expression of our faith. How do we express our faith? In humility. Offering proper sacrifices. Offering it the way God wants it, not the way we want it. In verse 5, we see the result of our faith in Enoch's life. He pleased God. We can please God the way Enoch pleased God. In fact, something very similar to what happened to Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 will happen to the Christian, the born-again person that has authentic faith in Christ when Christ raptures his church. We're going to be transferred. We're going to be translated. And in verse 6, we see that the only chance any of us have to please God 
is by, by simply just trusting him. Look at verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God will do everything he promised to do. He will reward you for seeking him. And a faulty understanding of faith will lead you to give up on Christianity before you ever even get started. As soon as temptation or hard times hit, you're done. Your faith is shallow. Your circumstantial faith will knock right over. Authentic faith is rooted in the conviction that no matter what happens, God loves me. And his will and his plan is best for me. Built on Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, not to those who are perfect, who've never messed up, who go to church all the time. No, it says those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. If you're called, if you belong to Jesus, you've got a lot to be happy about today. You need to claim the promises of Christ. See, our faith rests in the assurance that the God of the universe created us. He created you. He created me. He died for me. He rose again. He lives in me because I invited him into my life to forgive me of my sins. And he's coming back for me. That's pretty, that's wonderful. Everything's going to work out. He keeps his promises. Now, we've been talking about God keeps his promises all day. What are some of God's promises? What are some promises? There are thousands. There are literally thousands. What about Romans 6, 23? The wages of sin is death. That's a promise. Not one of the ones we want to claim this morning. But it's a reality. The wage of sin, your compensation for your sin is death. Separation from God for all eternity in hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's another promise. Most of God's promises are conditional like that. If you're willing to turn your back on your sin, give your heart to Christ, you're saved forever. For those of us that are saved, what about those other promises? What about God's presence? He promises his presence, didn't he? Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's right here with us now. He'll be with you at work this week. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. What about God's protection? Are you claiming God's protection? Do you believe that he's going to protect you? Go back to Isaiah 40, 10, 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise. That was a promise to God's chosen people that we derive the principle from, but it's still a promise. And there's so many more. There's thousands. We could be here till next week talking about all the promises of God. So put your chin up. Stick your chest out. God loves you. His promises are real for you. Claim them. Have faith in who he is. Have faith because of what he's done. He'll keep his promises. God is going to reward those who trust him, who please him. And in verse 6, those who diligently seek after him. May that be said of Kingsland Baptist Church. This is a church, you know, that, that, that they've got this and that and the other. But you know what? More than anything else, they seek after Christ. They have a passion for Christ. They want to know him in the power of his resurrection, just like Steve's verse this morning at baptism. Is your faith circumstantial or eternal? Do you have faith? Has your faith been destroyed? Do you need to reignite your faith? Are you trusting Jesus Christ with the critical areas of your life, with your kids, with your calendar, with your money, with everything, with the ministry you have, with your career, with your heart, with who you are? You know, sometimes when a person gets tired of their car, they trade it in. And if it's a nice car, they'll get several thousand dollars for it. If it's not that nice of a car, 50 bucks. But almost every dealership will take a trade-in, won't they? And they just jack it up on the other side and make you feel better and, and whatever. Why would someone trade in their car? Well, they don't need it. They want something far better. They want something new. They want something fresh. They want to smell that new car smell. I've never even smelled that smell in a car that I've owned. But it's a good smell. It's new. It's fresh. It's longer lasting. It's more dependable. It's superior to the old one. And today I'm not trying to get anybody to question their salvation or anything like that. What I'm saying is, if you say you're a Christian, but you have circumstantial faith, why don't you trade it in today to God's dealership and walk out of here with a brand new, authentic faith? 
And by the way, that's not going to happen in two minutes at the altar. That's not going to happen in a split. That's not like a decision, okay, God, I want to have authentic faith from here on out. It's not like that, is it? And we're going to talk next week about how to, how to develop authentic faith more more deeply. But today, really, just take a good look in the mirror and ask yourself. It doesn't matter. You could be 10, you could be 50 or 60 or 80. Has my faith really just been circumstantial that just kind of goes with the wind? Whatever. If things are going good, I'm happy. If things are bad, I'm not. Is my life marked by doubt and worry? My joy's low. I'm anxious, stressed out, negative. Why don't you just trade that in? Trade that in for a real, authentic faith that says, you know what? By the way, one of the promises I forgot to admit, uh, to, to mention, Revelation chapter 19 and 20 and 21 and 22. We win! That's a good promise. Read them and claim it and believe it because tough times are going to come in the temporary. And we have to remember the big picture. Authentic faith takes in mind the big picture. So as we close this morning, let me ask this question. Do you know you're saved? Do you even have faith? Today you may need to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and save you, to forgive you of your sins. Claim Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death, and that's where I've been my whole life, spiritually dead. That may be you, but you want eternal life. God gives it to you as a gift, for by grace are you saved, through faith. In John 10.10, Jesus says the thief comes to kill, rob, and destroy. Talking about that sorry bum, the devil. That's what he wants for you. He said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly, or to the fullest. We can have eternal life. If you're here this morning and you're not 100% sure that you have that, don't walk out of here with that. You don't have anything to trade in. Just go to the cross and say, Jesus, please save me. Please come into my life. I give my heart to you. Give your heart to Jesus. Place your faith and trust in Christ. And then follow the Lord in baptism, just like these young men did today, and live for him the rest of your life. But what about the Christians? Today's focus is really you and me, Christian person. Are you willing to trade in your circumstantial faith for an authentic faith? Something that's real. Something that will get you through the hard times that are inevitably coming. We could have a line of people that I'm seeing eyeball to eyeball that could come up here right now and tell you about life's most difficult circumstances because they faced them this week and in the last few months. And they're going through them. Right now, circumstantial, circumstantial mamby-pamby faith isn't going to come. It's not going to do that. Eternal faith will. Today, you want to trade in your circumstantial faith for an authentic faith. You want to develop a deeper walk with the Lord. Take advantage of this time. Make this a day where you decide, I want a deeper walk with Christ. I want to get real with God. I want the kind of faith that the people in Hebrews 11 possessed. Authentic faith. Would you pray with me? and stand. Would you pray with me as we all stand? Lord Jesus, this is a difficult subject because we really do want everything just to be okay and fine. We don't want to have to deal with the the nitty-gritty details of our faith. It's, It's uncomfortable to have to get out of that pew again and go to the altar. It's uncomfortable to have to reevaluate our lives where we've been rationalizing sin Oh, God, help us to get real with you today. I pray that somebody would trade in their circumstantial faith, faith that's got them to this far, but that's not going to take them the rest of the way. They need authentic faith. God, I pray that they trade it in today. And I pray that they would adjust their life accordingly to believe that your promises are true, that your presence, your protection, your provision, the salvation that you offer, not to be doubting those things, to trust you. Oh, God, may someone today say, I want to go deeper. I want to go much, much deeper in my walk with Christ. Your head bowed and your eyes closed as we sing Just As I Am in just a moment. I want to encourage you. If you've come to Christ today or recently, come forward and make a public profession. Request believer's baptism. If you're here today and you're doubting whether or not you are a child of God, whether or not you're on your way to heaven, that your sins have been forgiven, I want to encourage you to pray and invite Christ into your life right now where you're seated. If you'd like, you can come forward and someone will pray with you and introduce you to Christ personally. If God put a burden on your heart and today you want to, you want to get more serious about your faith, don't wait. Don't put it off. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Do something about it today as we sing, just as I am.
Folks know what God's doing in the hearts of uh, these folks that have come forward today, starting with TJ and Katie. They've come today uh, requesting baptism. And um, so next week, give them a hand. <laughs> next Sunday morning, we're going to baptize them and dedicate their little baby. So it's going to be a great day. Be here. Invite all your friends. Um, Brother Dennis is uh, praying there with Kevin. Dennis has come today to request, request baptism, too. So we're going to get him on the track for doing that. And Corey's already baptized. I made sure I knew that. But uh, he wants to become a member of our church. So Corey and Dennis and TJ and Katie and everybody, will get you all through the Class 101 and get you all uh, into the membership. So praise God that he's working in our lives uh, in and around our church. We're not done today. Uh, we have flock groups tonight. I want to just uh, give a testimony of God's greatness and what he's doing in, in the lives of the people of our church. We had 138 people in flock groups last Sunday night. And there's still more that are going to be meeting. So that's a blessing. So find a flock group. There's a map in the back that gives you some of the pins with where the flock groups are. You can talk to Jim Austin if you haven't already found one and um, get involved in that. On Tuesday night, we're going to do a special night of visitation. Tuesday night is our, it's our adult night. Uh, this this week, but we're inviting everybody. Anybody that wants to come, come. Adults, children, children workers, youth workers, everybody, come to visitation on Tuesday night, and we're going to knock out some of the visits, and we're going to push and promote the uh, fall festival, which is on Saturday. Please be here for the fall festival. It's going to be great. And lastly, um, we have the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry, which I mentioned earlier. The banquet is on Thursday night, October 27th. If you want to um, come to that, please do. Talk to Ashton Broccoli. His name's in the church directory. Give him a call. Reserve a spot. Um, Ann Graham Lotz's husband, Danny Lotz, is the speaker. So it's going to be great. It's as close as we can get to Billy Graham uh, on Thursday night. So be here for that. It's going to be, maybe you can tell some stories. And also, don't forget about the SDCV meeting on November 14th and 15th. We need to get some more messengers to go at that time. Thank you for being here today, guests. We want to thank you once again for, for honoring us with your presence. Um, we hope you'll come back. And I'm going to ask Jerry Moy, whose class is very involved with this fall festival on Saturday. I don't know if he's going to give any details about that, but he's going to close our service in prayer today. And uh, God bless you. Mm -hmm.
if you do want to sign up for uh, Fall Festival and be a volunteer, see me after church. We've got a lot of volunteers, but we need a lot more too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us incredibly again today with another awesome message, Lord, from your awesome word. Lord, we've been hearers this morning of your word. And Lord, I just pray that as we leave this building that we will become doers of your word. Father, in a congregation this size, there are so many needs that, have, are, that are unmet. And Father, you, you allow us to participate, to be used by you in meeting a lot of those needs. May we, may we be listening to your, uh, to your ways, Lord, to your spirit, to your movement, and help us to follow you diligently, Lord. Father, I also pray uh, that outside this congregation, that, and there are many that don't have a clue who you are, as Pastor Pat preached this morning, Father, that don't have a relationship with you. Um.